morning. I know I say it often, that's one of my favorites, that's one of my favorites, that's one of my favorites. I should just say, you know what, I love music. <laughs> and, but I'll tell you this before I get into today's uh, message. Any song that has the, uh, for me, it just makes you think, okay, that when the trumpet sounds, when the Lord calls us home, that when, you know, and the clouds roll back. I mean, I don't know about you guys. For me, as I listen, see, uh, I'm not too keen on reading, but man, music, I have the imagination as the words are rolling. I can just see the clouds rolling back. I can see my Savior. And, and, and it is, I don't know, it brings, makes, it brings goosebumps. It is so exciting. But I don't know if you catch this. In that song, Brother Foley, what's so beautiful about it is he's like, even with all that, it is still well with my soul. It's kind of like this. I don't care what happens in 2016, because it is well with my soul. Wow. Talk, talk about looking at a future. At, oh, man. <laughs> I, and if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior then that's just a song. Because it, it, it affects you to where you want to tell someone else, I want you to be, when that cloud rolls back, when the trumpet sounds, because it's not going to be just me who goes, oh, there's Jesus. Everybody's going to see him. Everybody's going to know the Lord is calling. It is time. And, he, I, and, and they keep adding to it. Well done, now, good and faithful servant. Okay, you know what that means? First of all, I better be a servant, and I better be doing what he's asked me to do, which actually is going to really roll us into what this morning is about. See, it's not just about blessed and fair, and fair warning. See, what takes place is I want us to just kind of grasp, because God has really placed on my heart a few things, especially in these, these opening weeks of the year. And, and one thing that takes place, especially here at Culver City Church of God, is that throughout the year, it, God just impresses to remind us what is His will, what is His purpose, who are we as the church. And I'm not talking about just here on this corner, but in the kingdom, so that everyone can come to know Him as Savior. What are we supposed to be doing? Because God asks us to do. A lot of times it takes place. If you remember last week... <laughs> Some probably were rejoicing because the title was what? Don't give. Don't give. Why? Because it dealt with our heart. You can do, you can have all the money in the world, you can have all the talents in the world, and, and you can try and give it all to the church, but it doesn't matter if your heart is not connected through the Holy Spirit with the Savior. Because it's given to us. So that we can have life with Him. And with life, there's this purpose with God. So our heart has to be right. And I'm going to tell you this. This is some of the things that I have discovered. That when the heart is right, the giving is, it, it, it's just like, there's this outpouring of God that is so personal. And I'm just going to leave it at that. Here's what takes place, though. <laughs> Here's what takes place. A lot of times, especially when you talk about giving or, or, or finances that Christ had talked about, a lot of people, a, a lot of pastors, a lot of ministers, I shouldn't say a lot. I should just say it this way. There are those that like to divide this up. There are those that want to just talk about the blessing. If you're going to give, let's talk prosperity. If you're going to give... Let's talk about blessings. Then there's others who are like this. You know, hell and fire, damnation's coming if you don't. And there's all these warnings in the Bible, so let's just focus on just the warnings. That way, because if I have the warnings, and I know all the warnings, then I'm probably going to be good because, you know, they're warnings. And people try, they try to focus on either or. Let me tell you, let me help you on, on this thought process. There are some verses in the Bible that they kind of pull out of context to use as prosperity. De uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. It says this, Remember the Lord your God? 
He is the one who gives you power to be successful or to have an estate or to have wealth. He is the one that gives you this, your possessions, in order to fulfill the covenant he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. Another one is Joshua 1.8 will take. Joshua 1.8 says this, study, study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night. So what? So you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. It's one of those, you know what, you better do this if you want to prosper. But prosperity is coming. If you just take the Ten Commandments, prosperity is coming. Then there's another one, Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, church, so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open up the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out blessings so great, you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. That's one we like. Man, we're like, you're going to pour all this out on me? I'm just going to give and woo, I'm going to sit back and take it in. God, start pouring. Man, my dollar's got to go a long way, huh, Jesus? If you'll just give, if you'll just give. That's the prosperity, the prosperity. And, there, you know, and just so we can connect the New Testament with the Old Testament, so we can read really, really, really biblical, then we also can pull out this. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. You know the generous grace. I like that. The generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that his poverty could make you rich. That's the New Living Translation. Because people, I'm telling you, if you're going to pick and choose scripture for prosperity, you might as well pick one that says some words you really, really, I like that translation. You know what? Jesus died for what? Let me translate that even. Jesus died so I can be rich. <laughs> that, uh, I'm telling you, even, yes, it's in the scriptures, but when you pull it out of context, context it is not holy. It is not the way God intended those verses to be passed down to us. Because let's go the other side, the warning side, because there's that side too. The, some of the warning verses are this, Proverbs eleven twenty eight: Trust in your money and down you go. But the godly flourish like leaves in the spring. Trust in your money and down you go. How about Jeremiah 40, 48, verse 7? Because you have trusted in your wealth and skill, you will be taken captive. Your God, Shemosh, with his priests and officials, you uh, will be hauled off to distant lands. Psalms 52, 7. Look what happens to the mighty warriors who do not trust in God. They trust in their wealth instead and grow more and more bold in their wickedness. And then let's go to the New Testament. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money which is so unreliable their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment that one's almost a double whammy thing not double whammy but like if you really read that one not really out of context about getting rich it says you know God's gonna give you stuff you need for your enjoyment what you need for your enjoyment it's not about prosperity and it's not about warning. It's not about either or. Both are in the scriptures. And, and both are, are, have been passed down to us so that we can grow spiritually in our walk, in our relationship with God. That's why Jesus actually uh, uh, spoke on finances. That's why he taught them uh, in areas of, of what it truly means to give. And how that heart has to be changed in this relationship with God. If I was to ask you, what is the most famous verse in your head that pops out about money? What would you say? Anybody want to pop one out? Get, that, that's a good one. Press down and shaking. What would the world think of money? If the world was going to quote a scripture, what would they quote us? Money is 
Money is the root of all evil. Sorry for misquoting that scripture, okay? Because <laughs> the scripture, it really, I'm telling you, that's what the world says. Money's the root of all evil. You should be having none. But that's not even what the scripture says. The scripture there, and I do believe it's in 1 Timothy, is, yeah, 1 Timothy chapter 6 is, for the love of money is the root of evil. What it's saying is, when you start to, to this, where, where your, 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 your horse blinders is all focused on the almighty dollar, then you're going to have problems. When you start to love money more than your family, money more than, your, than this over here, when you start to love money so much, this is when you're going to have the evil that's going to probably take place within your life. The stumblings that's going to take place within your life. The sin that is going to come up. The temptations that are going to come up because you're not focused on the Father. Is one of the things that we have. In the realm, though, of... Let, let, let me put... Uh, bear with me on my thought process here. Because, because money, money is not evil. Okay? And how, how do I come to this conclusion? Well, well, let me start this way. Let's talk about, let's talk about uh, you know, warnings and blessings for a moment. With water. Is it water? Water. If it's a blessing, if water is a blessing, what would it be a blessing for? Thirst. I'm thirsty. Okay? Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm thirsty. Let, let me help you on that one, Connie. I'm standing in the middle of the desert. <laughs> I'm standing in the middle of the desert. You're thinking blessing. Oh, Lord, just grant me a nice, cool, crisp, refreshing glass of water. That, that'd be a blessing. And, and if they just think, let's just, please bear with me. All of a sudden, bam, God has this nice, tall glass of ice cold. You can, and it's got to be crystal glass so that when the ice cubes are tinkling, lean in it you can hear because you got to have you got to have all the enjoyment of this nice cool refreshing glass of water you're in the desert which is not far from Culver City it's just a couple of little hour drives and you go oh that what a blessing there's also warnings with water how can we don't think about those more than we think of the blessing of water what are warnings with water we live on the coast what's that Flood. <laughs> Flood. I love the sign just down the street from our house. You are now leaving the, the tsunami zone. What? I, I, I always wonder. I could, does, does the tsunami come up to the sign and go, okay, this is as far as we go. <laughs> you know, is it one of those things, oh, now you got me, now you don't? What is that sign? It's a warning, though. It is a warning. There could be a tsunami that comes with the ocean. There could be uh, riptides, because uh, I love going and riding the waves. There could be riptides, and there's always a lifeguard coming out, tweet, 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 holding that big old funny-looking oval thing up. Come on, no, your weight. I know you think you can swim. You're too far out. You could get pulled out. Come on in with the riptides. There's those kind of warnings. So, someone said flood. I'll tell you what, it doesn't take much to ima imagine a flood. Just look at the great Mississippi right now. A little bit, not a little bit, a lot of bit of rain. <laughs> a lot of bit of rain, and, the, and winter brings flooding. So there's, there's warnings with water, along with the, jo the, 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 prosper the not prosperity, the joy of a cool drink of water. Let me go into another direction. Fire. Fire. With fire, there is... The, uh, if you have lived through the 70s, not the 60s, okay. If you lived through the 70s, and, and there was a famous television commercial. There's two actually that stick out for me for the 70s, and then I'm going to move on with it. One was the Indian crying. Does anybody remember that commercial? Don't pollute. Don't dump your trash at his feet. Remember that commercial? Then there was this one, Think, think Fire. What's the famous commercial in the 70s on fire? What's that? Smokey the Bear. What'd he say? <laughs> Only bears can prevent forest fires. <laughs> Only you can 
prevent forest fires. <laughs> There's a warning that fire's not good. Especially, and, and, and it's easy for us, is it not? Is it easy for us here? Because every year there is fire warnings. There is, you go to any park and there's that, that little thing, right? You know, how high is the fire, the, the danger today? There's always these warnings with fire. I'll tell you what though. Just this past Wednesday, Pastor Mark and Cindy, you guys are bringing up campfire, camp, camping. That's what really made me think about it. They're talking about their, their, your son was going out in the chilly, chilly weekend to go camping. Now I'm going to tell you, there's a blessing with fire. Yeah, how, if you, how many have ever camped? Okay. There is a blessing with fire. It is this. When it is cold, you get that fire going. And if you're a pyro, like I was as a Boy Scout, you get a raging fire going. And it is warm. I mean, warm where your pants start getting hot on your knees. And, and, you, and you're like, I don't even need the parka no more. It's that warm. There's a blessing with fire. Let me help you more on a blessing. What's the best thing you can do with a campfire? Make s'mores. <laughs> and you know what's good about s'mores? You always make some more of s'mores. Because you can't just have one. It's like Lay's potato chips. You got to have that chocolate, that melted marshmallow on a great blazing fire. There is a blessing with fire. One of the things that comes back with it, though, is because uh, uh, there's, there's warnings. Because I told you I was a Boy Scout, okay? A pyro Boy Scout. And here's one of the warnings. You know, we, we knew about Smokey the Bear. And here's the thing about Boy Scouts. This is what you're taught when you build a campfire. Make sure you have buckets of water ready. Because it takes three buckets to put a fire out. Three, three buckets. <laughs> I ain't got time for three buckets. And so, but what it is, you don't want a fire to smolder, so there's this warning. Don't let it smolder. Make sure you have enough buckets to put that fire out that is so precious to you. One of the other things with fire, we grow up, and most of the times our parents tell us what? Don't play with matches. <laughs> Why? You'll start a fire. There's the warning. Don't play with matches. Now, last week, I gave you the, the symbol of, of Cameron, the little two-year-old, playing with his car. Merry Christmas. Okay? Now, I'm going to go to the other two-year-old grandson, who is kind of like a pyromaniac. He loves fire. In fact, one time, we're getting ready to light the grill or something, and Connie pulls out you know, the, those long lighters so you can really, you know, we don't have to get burnt or anything. Pulls out the long lighter, and what does Elijah say? He's looking at the blessing and the fire. We're going to blow out candles. Blow out candles. He, he loves to blow out candles. You don't even have to have a birthday. Let's just light them up and blow them out. <laughs> There's a blessing. He finds joy in blowing out candles. There's a blessing in fire. There's blessing in, and warnings that come with it. But my point this morning is not about either or blessings of, of prosperity or richness or the warnings that come with make sure you don't get there this morning if you have your bibles turn to proverbs proverbs chapter 30 proverbs chapter 30 we have king solomon king solomon one of the you know, when we think of King Solomon, what did he do? He asked for wisdom. God says, I'm going to give you anything you want. King Solomon, whatever you want. I want wisdom. Wise, wise individual. Proverbs chapter 30. Starting at verse 7. Proverbs 30, starting at verse 7, says this. Oh God, I beg two favors from you. Let me have them before I die. First, help me to never tell a lie. Second, give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. For if I grow rich, I may deny you and say, Who is the Lord? And if I am too poor, I may steal thus and insult God's holy name. Here you have a man who has everything. He has everything. 
And so it's not so much about blessing and prosperity and riches, because here in his prayer, he's like, God, I'm going to ask. And I love it. It's like there's this humbleness that comes to him. I don't, how many, when I read that this morning, I'm like, man, I don't ever remember praying, God, don't help me to never tell a lie. I don't ever remember praying that. I know that's my heart's desire not to lie. God, I want to live a holy life and, and truthful. But here's Solomon, who's so, so wise, says, first of all, help me to not lie. And then second, and he does this double thing. I don't want to get rich, and I don't want poverty. It has nothing to do with finances. It has nothing to do with not having finances. It has to do with, God, I need to put my whole trust in you. He already had the riches. But yet he's saying, not riches. Why? Because he has this understanding that whatever these are, either way, blessing or warning, they could become a distraction in my life from seeing you. And so I put my whole trust in you, God, that what? That whatever I need will be given to me. Not what I want, what I need. Can you imagine having the opportunity to trust God so much that it, all of a sudden needs are being met? Okay? Not wants, but your needs are being met by God. And all of a sudden, I, I, it, it should do this. It should focus your attention on God so much that every little thing in your life that takes place, you're praising God for what happens. See, so many people are like, oh, that's just circumstantial that you found that. That's just circumstantial that that happened to go your way. That's just circumstantial. I don't care what you call it because I've been asking God to be in those circumstances and those circumstances turn out the way that it is needed for me. I praise God. So I'm going to tell you what, every once in a while I slip because it's always out loud where everyone's like, praise Jesus that that happened. Praise Jesus that that happened. Give glory to God that that happened. Thank you, God. I prayed that that would happen, and you did it. Not on my power. I trusted in you. And, and, and just so you can all have a quick understanding, I even get down to the common denominator of it. Are you ready? Because some people go, that, that ain't no prayer. What do you mean you pray? God did that for you? So I'm going to help you on the ending of that prayer. You know what, Jesus? Thank you for giving me the brain that helped me come to that point. See, let's go lowest denominator. Because God gave me the ability to see and to comprehend and to move in such a direction. God did it. He breathed the life into me anyways. Praise God for what's happening within my life. And I'm going to tell you this. Both good and bad. Why? Let's go back to King Solomon. Because good or bad... It allows me to focus and trust you. Amen is right. <laughs> so, what is it about this prosperity and warning, which it is not? What it does, here, let me tell you what trust does. Trust puts us, individuals, in a position with God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Trust puts us in a position with with God. And I'm talking about a holy position with God. And it goes like this. When you're in this trust mode with God in everything that is of who you are, when you are trusting God for your shelter, when you're trusting God for your finances, when you're trusting God for your education, when you're trusting God for your friendships, when you're trusting God with your close relationships, when you start trusting God with everything, all of a sudden, you start to see the position that you are in with the Holy God. And then all of a sudden, because of the way that focus is, that trust starts looking at the vision that God has for you personally. And if I may expand for the church here, not only does that trust make you see the vision and know the vision, but it also really focuses in on the purpose. 
Because sometimes vision is presented. Sometimes vision is before you. And you're like, what? It's easy to say that, God. It's easy to say that, so-and-so who says they're led by God. It's easy to say that. But let's look at the purpose. Let's look at the, the grandness of it. What is it? And I'm telling you, when you start to trust God fully, then all of a sudden, His purpose becomes your purpose. His vision becomes your vision. Not only that, but His will is played out within your life. And when I say His will, I mean this. What God has for you, it is so easy to trust and walk with Him in it. When you fully trust in Him. And then, all of a sudden, things start opening up. And now I'm going to come to the church. Trust fully in God. It, you remember I told you about praising Him? Junior church. Children's church. Children who are in Sunday school. I praise God. Then I start praying. God, here we are. And I'm going to just tell you how it is. This is, this is it. For, for, for a, a long time, trust opens up your eyes. And outside these doors, not those doors, outside the main doors, <laughs> you go outside. Anybody ever look at the church? You look at the church, and you see the flowers. You look at the church, and you see the trees. And, and please, uh, uh, this is my personal thing. This is, you want to talk about trust? Because here's how my prayer goes for a moment. God, we are the church with no grass. I know I have said that. <laughs> The church, we have no grass. <laughs> None. There's no grass nowhere. And so for me, uh, and bear with me for a moment, because for many years I dealt with young people I, and volunteered. And then late in life, not only did I volunteer, but I actually went into full-time ministry to specifically devoted to uh, affecting the lives of young people to point them to the Savior so that they could live a holy life, so that they could be forgiven. Why? Because it was important to me, and it still is, okay? Which is why I praise God for the young people that have been in junior church for a, a while now. And I don't know about you guys, every once in a while, you can hear the laughter downstairs. And there's probably going to be some people that will grace these, these, these walls, and they'll go... Do you hear that disturbance going on? Uh, yeah, you know what? I praise Jesus because that disturbance is being affected by the holiness of God. That's how I am. And so I began to pray, God, <laughs> I'm going to get the, well, let me get back to that sign. There is a, a, and it's not the Culver City Church, and we got enough, okay? We got Culver City Church of God in the parking lot. We got Culver City Church of God on that colorful sign in the front door area. We got Culver City Church of God on this faded sign that needs to be redone, which is going to be. And then, <laughs> and then we also have Church of God Anderson up on. We have Church of God planted everywhere on this church. And then there's a one sign. It is a bronze plaque. I believe it's bronze, bronze or copper, whatever that is on the side of the building when the church was uh, after it was, was erected it had a a presentation ceremony and that pl plaque was presented and on it it talks about how this church will and I'm just paraphrasing will affect the youth of this community here in Culver City now Trust God, trust God, trust God. That has not changed. Uh, and how I don't know it's not changed? Brother Bud still has the same heart that he had, maybe even stronger, because his name's on the plaque. I, I, I'm going to pick on him. His name is on the plaque. And so it's not picking on him. Thank you for vision. Thank you for purpose. At least a portion of it here. Because here, 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 here's how it is for me. It's not only the children's ministry, which is awesome. 
But there's going to be a young teen ministry that has to take place. Because why do I say that? Because when you're three years old and you're in fifth grade, there has to be something after that. It can't stop. There has to be the next thing. And so there's that younger teen ministry that has to take place. And guess what? When you have that, you also have to have the older teen ministry that has to take place. Notice the words I'm using here. Has to take place. Not only that, but there has to be this, I've graduated high school and I'm in this college kind of realm, that younger adult realm, and there has to be a ministry for the younger adults. And whoa, 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 whoa. And then once you're a younger adult, then you're growing up just a little bit more. I didn't say maturing, I just said growing. You're growing up just a little bit more, and there's the adults, and there has to be a ministry for the adults. Whoa, 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 whoa. Because we're going to keep on going. In fact, there used to be a billboard out on 90 there that said, hey, guess what? We're living longer, which means we're going to get older, which means we're going to live older. And we might even, I just talked to a lady as I was picking up Chuck and Stella, who is over 100 years old. And yes, we might get there. And we need an older adult ministry. And I'm going to tell you, if there's something after that, if Jesus has not called his church home, we need ministry. Now, ooh, that, I'm telling you, this is where this trust thing has to come in. Why? I'm going to be blunt. Ministry takes resources. Resources. You have to have something that comes in the place of the, the three-year-old. And I just picked three because you want to know the truth. You, I, you actually need a nursery, which is before three years old. You need to start, start, start. And so you need the resources for that. And you need the resources for the children. And you need the resources. And you need, ready, the resources for the adults and the older adults. Now, ready for trust to keep on going. I, I, please bear with me. Because we need the finances to do the resources to do ministry. This is not just to be like a hard-nosed, oh, we need to collect money. Because it has nothing to do with collecting money. It has to do with trust. And, and, and here is the hard thing. Because with trust, there might be change. See, some of you guys are freaking out, probably. <laughs> Man, pastor, you're talking about trusting God, and I know what you're saying, give some money so that we can have resources to do ministry, and then it might not even be what I like. <laughs> Ugh, like I said, I use the example. There's, there, not, you know, we're blessed, because I, I don't hear none of this here. There are churches that do not want to hear kids noise during service why <laughs> i i understand i understand you know th there's a di come on there's a difference there is outrageously loud and then there's just this pitter patter of you know what i heard that that's all right because <laughs> you know what bothers me when the fire engines go right beside us even though i pray for them <laughs> there's you know uh, uh, ah. we need to trust and this morning, the reason I'm saying it is because what a great opportunity at the beginning of the year to be reminded that we're not just to come here and sit in a pew. We're not here just to come and worship. Though, there is the blessing in doing that. In the thought process of ministry, can I help, can I help you for just one moment? It takes, re it takes finances to have heat. And I'll tell you, these, this heater has been cranked since I got here at about quarter to six this morning. And cranked it. Cranked it at, oh, it's at what it said. It says 73. <laughs> I thought it was 76. Downstairs, I cranked it to 76. And it had just gotten to 72 by Sunday school. It takes time to burn the oils 
to make the heat come in here. In the winter time, it takes time for the air conditioners outside to run along the top and make it cool in here, which for some, I don't never want it cool in here, right? You understand what I'm saying? But it takes, it takes, it takes, it takes for us to do ministry. Not just so that we can be comfortable, but so that in the setting that we have here, we can open up our eyes for this, to trust God more. So I'm going to ask this. Please, you know, this is not a giving sermon. This is this. And I'm going to ask you to stand and, and as we get ready to close, Pastor Mark. It's not a giving sermon. It is where this. I'm asking you as your pastor, that as, as our leaders gather together and, and look forward to this new year especially, that we will be praying for them. As they, as the leaders are, are, are diligently seeking out, God, what is the vision of the church, the purpose of the church? Are we in your will with the church? Always help us as leaders so that when we come together as a people, it's not just about, oh, uh, uh, whatever song we sing. But it's about praising God. Please be in prayer for the future of the church. And I say it this way, because this is how it has been impressed upon my heart for the moment. As I pray for the future of the church, I have this understanding. I might not be in it. Neither will you. Hear me out for just a sec. As I pray, God, as you lead this church, as you open up doors, as your people begin to trust you fully and really explode in the things that take place in this church. And I pray for it. And I pray for what is to come with, from as the classes he had spoke about, as the, 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 the interaction of individuals at every age group. As I pray for that, God, I have this understanding that the end result might not be at my presence. I might pass. I might strive here day after day, week after week, year after year, until I'm at such a place where I cannot do it anymore, where my strength has been expended, and all I can do is be the prayer warrior. And maybe even draw my last breath, and God's going to say this. All that you did, trusting me here and yes you drew your last breath here and I have not decided to call the church home but over here what you did over there is going to affect the lives that are right here so when I pray for the future of the church it is not for my own gratification it is not for my own joy or, or, or excitement it is for the end result that someone comes to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And I will do whatever I can to make it happen. Not that I can make it happen, but God, you threw me. Praise God for what's going to take place even tomorrow. Man, that can only come with trust. Shall we stand? God, as we prepare to leave this place, if there is someone here that does not know you as Savior, God, I pray, does not know that you died on the cross, shed your blood, so that we could have forgiveness, so that the things that have separated us from you, for the sin that is in our lives, for the things that we know go against you, God, the things that, that, that are there within our lives, we ask that your holiness will pour over us, cleanse us, Make us pure. Make us holy, God. And allow us that as our steps from this breath forward, our steps are a holy step. Our steps are a righteous step. Our step is a trusting step in the future that you have placed before us, God. Help us. And those of us that say we know you, God, give us strength. Give us that burning desire to have the trust
that at, maybe at one time we had that was so great that as your people said, let's move this way, as your people said, God is pushing us this way, that God, that we will trust in your purpose and your will. And that it might not be about us, but it'll be about your glory. And it'll be about your understanding for all that are surrounding. And we praise you for this moment that we have had to be used by you in Jesus' name.